Okay, we are now moving on from gravity and talking about another um, type of force. We're talking about electrical force, so it's charge in the electrical force. Um, now, it's different than gravity because we're talking about the attraction between two charges. So we're going to talk a little bit about what charges are, but it's similar in that it acts over a distance. And you're going to see... Um, you're going to see something very similar to the gravitational equation. So, before we get started, we're going to talk about different types of charges. We only have two. Two types of charges. Positive and negative. And you guys are already familiar with this from chemistry. Um, positive charge comes from protons. Negative charge comes from electrons. No big surprises there. So what we're going to say uh, is that the amount of a positive charge, because we need to be able to measure this, is um, Q, what we use for charges. So Q of a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And the charge on an electron, Q of an electron, is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So they have the same size of charge, uh, but one is positive and one is negative. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this C thing. It stands for a coulomb. It's a unit of charge. It's a huge amount of electrons or a huge amount of protons. But we are going to use coulombs to measure charge. That's what that little C is about. And this is kind of where its definition comes from. The charge of one electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. One of the big rules that we need to deal with is that charge cannot be created or destroyed. So when I charge an object, I'm not creating charge. I'm doing something different, and we'll talk about what that is. And another thing we need to keep in mind as we talk about this is that all objects contain charges. You right now, though you may be overall neutrally charged, contain an equal amount of positive charge and negative charge. So, uh, just to look at it, to draw this out a little bit, a positive charge, a positively charged object, means you have more protons than electrons. That object has a greater number of protons than electrons. A negatively charged object has more electrons than protons. And this should be things that you know. A neutral object has an equal number of protons and electrons. Now, to charge an object... Okay. Equal number of each. To charge an object means that we are removing some charge from that object or adding charge to that object. We're not creating charge, we're just redistributing it. Now, to do that, what we're doing is moving electrons. Charging an object is the transfer of electrons from one object to another. The reason we don't transfer protons is because protons are inside of the nucleus. And when you change things around in a nucleus, you have a nuclear reaction, and those are bad. So charging an object, changing the charge of an object, is moving electrons. It turns out things don't blow up when you move electrons. So we have two ways to do that. One is to charge by conduction, and the other one is to charge by induction. Conduction is easy. That's just direct transfer, a transfer by touching two objects together. If I touch a charged object to an uncharged object, the charges move from the charged object to the uncharged object. They share charge. Now, you're used to this, especially in the wintertime. If you've ever shocked something, 
you are charging that object by conduction. Okay. Charge by induction is a bit of a process. It's a little bit more complicated than just touching an object. So imagine that we have a neutral metal sphere. And what we're going to do is bring a negatively charged object near that neutral metal sphere. Now, inside the neutral metal sphere, we have a lot of positive and negative charges, and they are associated with each other. When we bring that negative rod by near to it, it's going to push all the negative charges away from that negative rod. Negative charges don't like each other. Uh, they feel a repelling force, and they move away. And what we're going to get when that negative rod is there is an object that is positive on one side and negative on the other side because we've pushed those charges away. We call that object polarized. It's still overall neutral, but I have negative charges on one side, positive charges on the other. Now, in order to get that object to be charged, I have to remove some of those charges. So if I connect the negative side to ground, they will go even further away from that negative charged object, and they will flow off of the sphere into something else. And when we're finished, we're left with an object that is overall positively charged. But I never touched that rod to that object. We'll actually play around with this a little bit in class on Monday. It'll be a fun little demonstration. One of the things that makes this process possible is the fact that we were talking about, apologize for that, the fact that we were talking about a metal sphere. In a metal, charges are free to move around. If you tried to do this with a tennis ball, it wouldn't work. Because on the tennis ball, it's an insulator. Charges are not free to move around. But in a metal, we have a sea of electrons, uh, so they are free to move around all they want. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is Coulomb's Law. And just a second. I misspelled Coulomb. Sorry about that. So, Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law is how we're going to describe electric force. So the same guy that this unit for electric charge is named after is the same guy that the law is named after. Now, Coulomb's Law looks like the electric force equals K times Q times Q over R squared. It looks almost exactly like the um, gravitation force law, but here instead of a gravitational constant we have Coulomb's constant. Which is a different number. It's 9 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. And instead of talking about mass, we have big Q and little q, which are two different charges. Two different amounts of charge. And R, just like what we had before, is the distance between these two charges. All we're going to do with Coulomb's Law right now is calculate the electric force between two charges. And then look at how that force might change if we increase the distance between the two charges, decrease the distance between the two charges, or change the amount of charge that we have. So let's do an example of that. Oh, before we do that, a Coulomb is a huge amount of charge. So what we're going to have to do uh, is look at our metric prefixes because we're going to be talking about microcoulombs and nanocoulombs instead of just full coulombs. So the C is just a coulomb. The little m is a millicoulomb. The mu is a microcoulomb. The n is a nanocoulomb. The P is a picocoulomb. 
Now, these mean different things. Milli is 10 to the negative third. Micro is 10 to the negative six. Nano is 10 to the negative ninth. And pico is 10 to the negative twelfth. You're going to need to know how to go back and forth between these. And I'm going to tell you in this example how that's going to work. So, here's our example. We have a one microcoulomb charge that is 0 0.03 meters away from a negative 2 microcoulomb charge. And I want to know the force between these two. What force does the 1 microcoulomb charge experience because of the 2 microcoulomb charge? So I'm going to draw a picture just to look at it real quick. We have plus 1 microcoulombs, negative 2 microcoulombs, and they are 0 0.03 meters apart. I have a positive charge and a negative charge. We all know that they are attracted to each other. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. And so each one is going to experience a force inward. These are going to be equal and opposite forces. Okay? The positive one, the positive charge pulls on the negative charge, the negative charge pulls right back with the same force. This is a Newton's third law thing. So each charge experiences an equal and opposite force. So let's figure out how much that force actually is. So the force is KQQ over R squared. So let's substitute in for K. That's 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. Put in our first charge, 1 microcoulomb, and our second charge, negative 2 microcoulombs, divided by our radius squared. Now, looking at this, I have meters squared on the top and meters squared on the bottom. So those can go away. But I can cancel out the coulombs because I have microcoulombs from each of my charges and regular coulombs in our coulomb constant. So here's what we're going to do. Everywhere we see a micro symbol, that little mu, we're going to write in times 10 to the negative 6. Uh, that's, how, that's how we're going to convert. It's really easy. We don't have to do railroad tracks. Just everywhere you see micro, you're going to write in what that stands for, times 10 to the negative 6. So let's do this again. 9 times 10 to the 9th, and it's just going to be newtons per coulomb squared because we already crossed out meters. Now we have plus 1, but instead of that micro, I'm going to write times 10 to the negative 6th coulombs. I'm going to do the same thing for the negative charge. Now looking at this, I got coulombs on top, coulombs on the bottom. They all cross out. So my units are going to come out to be newtons. And we put this into the calculator. We see that that force comes out to be negative 0 0.002 newtons. That's our force. And that negative sign tells us it's attractive. If it were to come out positive, it would have been a repelling force. On Monday, we will practice a little bit with this. Uh, and we will look at charging objects by conduction and induction.